Good day, Grade 12. So welcome to this next lesson in mathematics. In this lesson, I've said that we're going to do differentiation, and we are, but I'm going to start with the factor theorem because you cannot differentiate, and well, you can differentiate, but the main reason for differentiating is to be able to draw polynomials, and you cannot draw polynomials, which are cubic graphs, unless you can factorize using the factor theorem. So we're first going to do the factor theorem and then we're going to move on to differentiation. Okay, right. So this is a used method used to factorize polynomials. Polynomials, remember, are mathematical expressions which have three or more three or more terms and usually have the power of three or more. So it's y equals ax squared plus bx plus plus c is not a polynomial. Just remember, nomial means like a term. Well, nomial does mean a term. So therefore, you've got a monomial would be y is equal to x squared. A binomial would be y is equal to mx plus c. That's a binomial, two terms. This is a trinomial. It's got three terms. And a polynomial is three or more. Again, it's, I mean, usually more than three terms. So would be y is equal to ax cubed plus bx squared plus dot 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 okay and they usually have a power of three or more okay so examples are x cubed plus 2x squared plus 3x plus 2 and it's called a cubic polynomial because the highest um, number the highest exponent is a three okay right so let's carry on um it's similarly, the general term for a cubic polynomial is y is equal to ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus c, where obviously a cannot equal naught. Otherwise, it would not be the polynomial anymore. It would be back to a trinomial. So let's look at an example. It says factorize f of x is equal to x cubed plus x squared minus 9x minus 9. When we factorize, if I ask you to factorize a trinomial, what are we doing? We're finding where it cuts the x-axis. And what's special about the y value at these points? Do you agree that the y value at these points is zero? Okay, so if I ask you to factorize a, a trinomial, what are we doing? Or quadratic? We are finding where it cuts the x-axis. Now, similarly, yeah, exactly the same thing. We're trying to find where this graph, this polynomial, cuts the x-axis. So what we're going to do is we're going to let y equal naught. Okay, so therefore we've got naught equals x cubed plus x squared minus 9x minus 9. Now we have to somehow, normally what we do at this point is we would try and solve for x, okay, like you would with this, okay, if I gave you x squared plus 2x plus 1, you would immediately go, okay, well, how do I make factorize that, assuming this is 0? Okay, so we're going to do it slightly differently with this. We're not going to let y equal naught. What we're going to do is find a value for x that makes y naught. Okay, do you understand? So we're not going to, we're going to do it slightly opposite. Yeah, we let y equal naught, and then we solve for x, okay? Yeah, we're going to find an x value that makes y naught. So let's try, and you usually try 1 minus 1, 2 minus 2, and try and find the values of x that will work. So we go f of 1. So what we're saying is that wherever we see an x, we have to write 1. So that becomes 1 cubed plus 1 squared minus 9 times 1 minus 9. Okay, let's have a look at that. That becomes 1 plus 1 minus 9 minus 9. So it does not equal 0. Okay, now let's try f of minus 1. If we substitute minus 1 wherever we see an x, we've got minus 1 cubed plus minus 1 squared minus 9 times minus 1 minus 9. Okay, minus 1 cubed is just minus 1 plus minus 1 squared is 1, minus times a minus is a plus 9, minus 9. Oh, yay, that works because minus 1 plus 1 goes away. They cancel. And plus 9 minus 9 cancels. So that equals 0. Therefore, we can say that x equals minus 1. When x equals minus 1, y equals 0, okay? Therefore, we can say that x plus 1 is a factor. Okay, remember if I said you factorize this, what do we do? We go x plus 1, 
x plus 1, right? Remember that. And what happens is we say that that's a factor and that's a factor, right? Because these two, when multiplied, form this. So what we're saying is that, and then what do we do? Sorry, when we get back to this, we go, well, that equals naught. To solve when this works, we go naught equals x plus 1 or naught equals x plus 1, right? Therefore, x equals minus 1. Get the point. Now, exactly the same thing here. We're just doing it backwards. We're saying x equals minus 1. Therefore, x plus 1 is a factor. So we're going backwards, okay? So now I've got x plus 1 works. Okay, so now I'm going to erase all my ink. Now remember grade 12s, if you missed something, you're welcome to watch the recording. Okay, just go and press the same buttons as you did to get here. Okay, so now we have to work out how, what the rest of this bracket is. In the previous one, it's very easy because we're factorizing. Now we're saying when we divide x plus 1 into this, what do we get uh, What do we get out? Okay, so I just want to show you, I'm just going to detour for a second. If I, I don't know if you guys remember long division. Let's say I'm dividing 21 into, okay, let's make it easier. Let's make it slightly easier. Let's make that. Let's divide 8, 8 into 4, 6, 3, 9. Okay, so what do you do? Because 8 goes into 4, no it doesn't, but 8 goes into 46 how many times? Well, 6 eighths of 48, but 5 eighths of 40. So we can go, well, it goes 5 times. Then you go 5 times 8 is 40, and you're left with 6, and you bring down a 3. Okay, do you remember this? You go 8 goes into 63, etc., etc. So what this is, is long division. Now we're going to do essentially the same thing with this, except we're going to do it on the line. Yeah, we've got x cubed plus x squared minus 9x minus 9, and we've got x plus 1. Okay, now I'm going to show you this method for the simple reason that some students find it easier, and then I'm going to show you the bridge method, or what I call the bridge method, and then you guys can decide which way is easiest for you, okay? So what you do is you divide the x into the x cubed. So you got x goes into x cubed x squared times, right? So then you go x squared times x gives you x cubed plus x squared. Okay, 1 times x squared is x squared. And then you subtract. You subtract, and that goes away, and that goes away, right? So then you go, right, now I need to divide this x plus 1 into the minus 9x. You're just dividing this dude into this bit. So minus 9x divided by x is minus 9 right? So you go minus 9 times x is minus 9x. Minus 9 times by plus 1 is minus 9. And yay, when we subtract them, they work. So therefore, this bracket here, this bracket, is going to be x squared minus 9. Okay, now that we've got that solution already, using the long division method, Okay, and grade twelves, I really don't mind if you use the long division method or if you do the bridge method. I just mind care that you get it right. So I'm going to show you the other method as well, so you can decide. But let's just finish off this bit first, because what is this? This is the difference of two squares. So do you agree that becomes x plus one, x minus three, x plus three? Okay, so those are the three factors of this thing, which means that this thing cuts the x-axis in three places. Okay, now before we carry on talking about that, let's just talk about how we would get this if we were using the bridge method. Okay, so you've got x cubed plus x squared minus 9x minus 9 is equal to x plus 1. We had that already. Now what you do is you go first goes into first. So x goes into x cubed, leaves you with x squared. Last goes into last, gives you minus 9. Okay, now normally you have a middle term. Okay, normally you have a middle term of x. Okay, so you're going to write plus kx, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, fine. But now we need to find a value that gives us, okay, so what do we have? We've got this times that gives that divided into that gives you x squared and this divided into this gives us minus 9 okay now 
if we multiply the next thing, we need an x squared. So, okay, do you understand what I'm saying? So we're going, hang on a minute, let me just make this look neater. Okay, so we went x cubed divided into x gives you x squared. Or let's put it this way, x times x squared gives you x cubed, right? Minus 9 to plus 1 is minus 9. Okay, so that's that one. Now we're saying kx. kx, if we went kx times by x, okay, plus this one, kx times by 1, Oh, no, I'm wrong. Sorry, I'm getting this all confused. Sorry, sorry. How to confuse the crap out of you. Sorry. <clears throat> okay, let's try again. <laughs> sorry. We're going to go 1 times x squared is x squared. Okay, and then we're going to go x times kx plus kx. kx times by x has to equal to x squared. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Let me try again. Let me explain it to you once more. What we do is we're going x times x squared gives me x cubed, right? Then we're going to go x times kx, okay? x times kx plus this, plus 1 times x squared is x squared, has to equal to whatever the x squared term is here, which is x squared, okay? But do you see that x squareds cancel? So we get kx squared is equal to x squared minus x squared. So therefore, kx squared is equal to 0. So what does k have to be? k equals 0. So this becomes a 0 and goes away. So you end up back at this. Okay. I'll show you another example in a minute, okay, to show you how to get this. So that is the factor theorem. The first thing you do is always substitute values in to try and make f of x equal 0, and then you divide. Let's do another example and make, to make sure you understand it, okay? So again, we need to find for which values of x this works. So what we're going to do is we're going to let, again, x equal 1. Okay, if we do this, you get 1 cubed plus 8 times 1 plus 17 times by 1 plus 10. And you can see it obviously does not equal 0, so we don't even have to go any further. Let's try x equals minus 1. If that's the case, it's minus 1 cubed plus 8 times by minus 1 squared plus 17 times by minus 1 plus 10. This possibly has potential, this becomes minus 1 plus 8 minus 17 plus 10. That becomes minus 18 plus 18 equals 0. Yay! So therefore, when x equals minus 1, y equals zero, the whole of this expression equals zero. So now we can substitute, we can divide that into a factor into the whole thing, okay? So let's do that, let's do that. Okay, so we're gonna choose a pen color. Okay, so what we're saying is x cubed plus 8x squared plus 17x plus 10 is equal to x plus 1. Remember you do it the other way. When x equals minus 1, y equals 0. Then if you take it across and you get x plus 1 is your factor equals 0. You solve back for 0, right? And then we go. First into first is x cubed. So it's first into first. Then it's last into last. Last into last. So that's going to be plus 10, okay? Then what do we do? We go, well, sorry, that's x squared. Typo. Okay, squared. Okay, then we go. This times this gives me x squared. Okay, that times that gives me x squared. Then this times the middle term here is also going to give me an x squared. So let's write that as plus kx, okay? So in other words, what I'm saying is plus x times by k 
kx has to equal 8x squared because that's what the x squared term is, okay? So do you agree that is x squared plus kx squared is equal to 8x squared, okay? So do you agree that kx squared is therefore equal to 7x squared? I mean, x squared is equal to 7x squared. I mean, sorry, no, it's right. kx squared equals 7x squared, so therefore k is 7, which means this number here is 7. So now we can rewrite that. We can go... Dun, 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 dun. And that becomes, I'm just going to put that a little bit closer, plus 7x plus 10. And now all we need to do is factorize this thing if we can. Okay, so factors of x squared, obviously 1 and 1, because the coefficient of x squared is 1. The factors of 10 are 10 and 1 and 5 and 2. And we need to have them add up to 7 because this tells me that both the signs are the same and they're both plus. So therefore it becomes x plus 1, x plus 5, x plus 2 equals 0. And this it's solve for x. So now we actually have to find the values of x. So what do we do? We go therefore x plus 1 equals 0 or x plus 5 equals 0 or x plus 2 equals 0, therefore x equals minus 1, or x equals minus 5, or x equals minus 2. So just to give you an idea of why we're doing this factor theorem thing, is that this thing is actually a polynomial function. So what it does, okay, and there's a terrible drawing, but it's going to be rough. It goes through plus 10, okay. It cuts at x equals minus 1, minus 1, at x equals minus 5, oh, okay, let's just redraw that, okay, there we go, it's better, it cuts at 10, it cuts at x equals minus 1, x equals minus 2, and x equals minus 5. I know it's not to scale. So it does something like this. It comes down here, goes along, goes up, and then does that. At the moment, we don't know exactly what's happening over there. We know it goes down, we know it turns and everything else, but we don't know exactly what's going on. We just know it's x cuts and it's y cut. So, so far, what we're doing is using the factor theorem to find out where this graph is cutting the x-axis, okay? And this is why it's the start of the differentiation section because like I said, with differentiation, we're going to use differentiation to, one of the things we're going to use differentiation is to actually find these turning points. We're going to find out where this graphs turn, okay? Right, now this is a different example of the polynomial, I mean of the factor theorem. Except it's called the remainder theorem. <laughs> no, okay, think about it this way. If it's a factor, then when you divide it in, then you when you, when you divide it in, you don't get a remainder. Okay. In other words, if I say to you, what is a factor of twenty? You would say four. And why? Because four times five equals twenty. But twenty does not have a factor of four and a half because that's not a factor. It doesn't divide perfectly into twenty. When you have something that doesn't divide perfectly, it has a remainder. Okay, so what we are saying then is that if we had this function here, a of x equal to x to 5 minus 2x cubed plus px minus 1, is divided by x minus 1, the remainder is minus a half. So what we're saying is when we let, okay, this is going to be x equal to 1, right? Because if x minus 1 is the factor, then we substitute in x equal to 1. When we let x equal to 1, then this whole expression is going to equal minus a half. Instead of it equaling 0, which is how we've proved something is a factor, it's now going to equal minus a half, right? So what we want to know is the value of p, but we can just substitute this in now and we can find the value of p. So every time we see an x, we're going to write 1. So we've got 1 to the power of 5. 
minus 2 to the power of 1, I mean times 1 to the power of 3, plus p times 1 minus 1 is equal to minus a half. Okay, so what is that? That's 1 minus 2 plus p minus 1 is equal to minus a half. So 1 minus 1 goes away, so then it becomes p, it takes it across, becomes 2 minus a half, so p is going to be 1 and a half or 3 over 2. Okay, and that's it. That's how easy this question is. You must just remember that if it's a factor, then we're letting this whole expression equal zero because that's what a factor does. It makes that expression zero. If it's not a factor, then we are looking at letting the remainder, this value, equal whatever the remainder is. Now, let's talk about differentiation. Okay. And the whole thing about differentiation is that it was a method to solve a problem, okay? Some, the, it's actually quite amazing. These mathematician guys, they needed to solve a problem. So what did they do? They made up new maths and it works. It's amazing. Okay, so let me explain. If you've got a straight line graph, let's say you've got the straight line graph going along here. Okay, um, let's try highlighting it, shall we? Here you go, that's a straight line graph there. Okay, if I said to you, I want you to find the average gradient of that graph, what would we do? We'd say, okay, fine, let us find two points on the graph. Let's say we've got that point and that point, okay? So they're telling us that the x value is a and the y value is a plus h. And the, I mean, and the x value is a plus h and the y value of this is f of a and the y value of this is f of a plus h. In other words, you know that you've got f of x is equal to da 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 da. Okay, right? So that there is the same thing as saying the y. Okay? So this point's values here are a f of a. Right? That's x and y. This dude's points are a plus h. Oh, sorry. Uh, it is a plus h in brackets, but I need to make it neater and more obvious what's going on here. It's going to be a plus h, f of a plus h. Okay, so if this is x1, y1, and this is x2, y2, do you agree I could find the gradient by going? We know that m is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay, do you agree with that? Okay, so then do you agree? I could say, well, if that's the case, y2 is f of a plus h minus f of a all over a plus h minus a, which becomes f of a plus h minus f of a all over h, because these cancel. Okay, so do you agree that is actually the formula of an average gradient of a line? Okay, happy with that. It's a bit complicated in wording and lifting and everything else, but it's basically the same thing, okay? And what is h? h is just some random number further on, okay? So this could be 1, it could be 2, it could be 3, we don't know. Okay, right, so now what happens is, okay, same principle, but now let's say, for example, instead of looking at the equation of a straight line, let's say some dude says, well, actually, I want the equation of the gradient at that point there, at that point. Okay, so let's say, take this a little bit bigger. Let's make it really big. Okay, and let's say that this, oh, let me make it more curvy. Let me make it more curvy. Oh, what happened? Raise link. Okay, so let's make it more curvy. Whee, that's a bit better. Okay, so here is point A, and here is point A plus H, and I want the equation at that point there. Okay, so at the moment I draw a line. Now I draw a line through those two points there. So do you agree that I'm kind of getting the average gradient, but not, not getting the gradient at that point? Almost, but not quite, okay? Now let's say I make this h distance a little bit smaller. 
Okay, let's say I make this edge distance a little bit smaller. Do you agree that my new line, let's change color, is going to be there? Okay, which kind of gets to my X, but not quite. Okay, but now let's say I make it even smaller, but this time I bring the A closer. Okay, so this time I bring the A closer. Yes, A going closer. So do you see what's happened? I'm making this gap this gap that I'm moving across smaller and smaller. And as I'm doing it, I'm getting closer and closer to the gradient at that point. Not quite, but almost, okay? Now, if we make this gap infinitesimally small, if we could somehow take a microscope and show that we can make this gap infinitesimally small, we do this and we do that, okay? So it's really, really small. So that gap there would be A, and A plus H, then do you agree that I would get basically as close as I could to the gradient at a specific point? So in other words, I'd be getting the gradient of the tangent at that point. Do you agree? I'd be getting the gradient at that exactly the same point, okay? So that is the principle of, dif of differentiation, okay? Principle of differentiation is that they are trying to find the gradient at the point by making this H as small as possible as possible, as small as possible. Okay, so what do we know so far? Okay, so let's just erase all the writing again. So far we know that the average gradient M is given by F of A plus H minus F of A all of H. Okay, that is what our average gradient it is. Okay, now what we're saying is that we can find the gradient at a point if H is really, really, really small, okay? If H is very, very, very small, do you agree that we will get to a point where the gradient will effectively be, will effectively be the gradient at that point, okay? So now what they say is, therefore, they call it a new thing. They call it the derivative, the derivative. And the derivative, and this is the formula that's on your formula sheet says that d by dx is equal to, hang on, let me just write this properly. The limit as h tends to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, where instead of a specific numbers, they're just using the randomized x, as in because that's the x value. And all they're saying is that this value, this is the value we're going to get if h is actually so small that effectively it's zero. And what is this d by dx? They, the d actually stands for, do you know how the big capital D, this thing here, stands for change in? and how we use it for gradient or slope, okay? Now, that is actually the capital letter D in the Greek letter the alphabet, okay? The baby letter D is this thing here, okay, delta. But now somehow, instead of writing delta, we've eventually translated it to D by DX. And what we're saying is that if the steps of X, if we differentiate with respect to X, in other words, if we find the limit of this, with respect to x, if we find the change the values of x, we're changing the values of x to a very small amount, then we will be able to find the gradient. Okay, so basically you need to actually be able to prove differentiation by first principles. Okay, you need to be able to derive the formula for differentiation by first principles. Okay, so the way it works is this, okay? Um, let's show you. Okay, it says calculate the derivative of g of x equals g of x minus 1 from first principles. And this formula is on the formula sheet. It says f dashed of x, which is the same as d by dx, which means the derivative. The derivative of x is equal to the limit as h tends to 0 f of x plus h minus f of x all over h, okay? 
that is on your formula sheet. So there's no reason for you to tell me that you're going to get this wrong. Okay, it's on your formula sheet. Now, what they want us to do is calculate the derivative of this from first principles. Okay, so what they really want is the gradient, the generalized equation for the gradient of g of x. Okay, because this, sorry, just to go back up, this rule works for every point on the curve. Okay, it would work for this point over here, it would work for this point over here, it would work for every single point on the graph, depending on where x is. So if I wanted to get that point there, I would obviously use this value of x, and then this value here of say x plus h again. So it really doesn't matter where on the graph I'm doing this, okay? So it's a general formula for the whole graph, okay? Finding the gradient. So let's have a look at it. We know, we can look at this, I'm really hoping great tools you can, you know, look at this and you, can, you immediately know what the gradient of this is. It's a straight line graph, it has a gradient. I'm not saying what the gradient is, it should be pretty obvious, okay? But now we're going to use this law to prove that gradient, okay? So what I would suggest you guys do is, we've got f of x, that's g of x, okay? So g of x equals x minus 1. Now we need, we need g of x plus h. Okay, it doesn't matter if you write f of x or g of x, it's the same thing. So I honestly would suggest that you write g of x plus h here and write it, work it out. Okay, this is a really easy example, but you get like a lot more complicated examples in the exam. So, and we're going to go through quite a few more complicated examples. So it's easier, always easier if you've written out the g of x plus h first, okay? So that means that wherever you see an x, you're going to write x plus h. So it becomes x plus h minus one and i know this is a really easy example but again i want you to practice putting in x plus h in brackets where we see an x and then you can make it nice and go x plus h minus one and multiply whatever minuses you need to right now we need to substitute in this formula so we get f dash of x is equal to the limit as h tends to zero of f of x plus h is this thing here so you always have to write down your rule so that your teacher knows exactly what you're doing, okay? Which is the limit as h tends to zero, and you're gonna keep writing this until I tell you to stop and I'll show you why. Of, this is x plus h minus one minus, and remember you need a bracket, x minus 1. If you don't put the bracket in, I guarantee you grade 12s, you're going to mess up. So this becomes the limit as h tends to 0 of x plus h minus 1 minus x plus 1, all of h, okay? Which becomes the limit as h tends to 0 of x cancels with minus x and minus 1 cancels plus 1. And what are we left with? We're left with h divided by h, which is just 1. So you don't even have to worry about the limit as h tends to 0 because h divided by h is 1. And yes, that is the gradient of this. So this is a slightly more um, tricky example in the sense that you didn't have to worry about the h tends to 0. But I will do more examples where you have to actually take that into consideration. So there you go. That's how you find the derivative using first principles. Let's do a slightly more difficult one. Yeah, we've got h of x equals 4x squared minus 4x. So obviously, what do we need? We need an h of x plus h. Okay, what that's saying is wherever we see an x, we need to write x plus h. So it becomes 4x plus h all squared minus 4 x plus h. And now we actually need to multiply this out to get what we want. Okay, so it becomes 4, this is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared, okay, that's a plus, minus 4x minus 4h, and now we need to multiply this out, it becomes 4x squared plus 8xh plus 4h squared minus 4x minus 4h. Okay, so that's all h of x plus h, right? Now, I'm going to write it up here. h of x plus h is equal to 
x squared plus 8xh plus 4h squared minus 4x minus 4h. Okay, that's all h of x plus h. So now what we do is we erase all the other stuff. And we're actually going to do this question from the beginning using first principles. So we say, I'm going to try and write a bit neater so that you can understand. So we go h dashed of x equals the limit as h tends to zero of h of x plus h minus h of x all over h. Okay, I apologize for skew line. Equals the limit as h tends to zero. This thing is this horrible thing up here. So it's 4x squared plus 8x h plus 4h squared minus 4x minus 4h minus bracket. And what was the original? The original was 4x squared minus 4x all over h. Okay, now we need to get rid of the brackets. So it becomes the limit as h tends to zero. 4x squared plus 8xh plus 4h squared minus 4x minus 4h. And you'll notice I haven't added anything yet because they're no long like terms, unfortunately. Then minus times the plus is minus 4x squared and minus times the minus is plus 4x. Okay. All over. All over H. Okay. So then what happens? Let's now see if there's anything that's cancelling. So let's go. 4x squared cancels with minus 4x squared. Minus 4x cancels with plus 4x. Okay. So what are we left with? We're left with, in the red, the limit as h tends to zero, what's left? 8xh plus 4h squared minus 4h all over h. Now, do you see these common factors of h here? Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take out a common factor of h. And I'm going to write over here. Okay, I'm going to write up here. But guys, you write, should be writing underneath it, okay? So it becomes limit as h tends to zero of, let's take out a common factor of h, what are you left with? 8x plus 4h minus 4 all over h. So do you agree I can take, cancel those, okay, and what are we left with? We've got the limit as h tends to zero of 8x plus 4h minus 4. Now what this means comes into play, and what does that mean? It means, what does this expression become as h gets closer and closer to zero? What does this expression become? So effectively, what we're saying is that h is equal to zero. We're saying h is so close to zero that the minus will be considered to be zero. So if that's the case, do you agree this is no longer valid because it's four times zero? So the answer is 8x minus four. And that's where you drop the limit. The first time you drop the limit is when is is when the last line where you have substitu substituted an h equals zero effectively into wherever the h's are. Okay, now grade 12, seriously, if you leave out a limit as h tends to zero in any one of these lines except the last line where you've already where you've let h equals zero, you are going to lose marks. You are very seriously going to lose marks. You have to have to have to show it. Okay, now, wow, let's do this one. Okay, now this is quite a tricky one, I must admit. So we're going to do it nice and slowly. The first thing we're going to do is work out what f of x plus h is. So we're going to go f of x plus h is going to be 1 over x plus h minus 2, which is just 1 over x plus h minus 2. Yes, that part wasn't tricky at all. Let's find f dashed of x. So f dashed of x equals the limit as h tends to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Okay, so let's substitute in. It gives the limit 
as h tends to zero of this thing here becomes one over x plus h minus two minus one over x minus two all divided by h okay and that's where it gets a bit nasty so what i'd like to do is since we've run out of time i would like to challenge you um, to take a screenshot of this or quickly write down f of x is equal to one over x minus two and try this question for yourself for tomorrow we will be carrying on with this tomorrow and then we're going to be moving on to lots of different things to do as a derivative okay have a great evening cheers